Grammar Girl is brought to you by Babbel, the number one language learning app in the world. Babbel has 14 different languages you can learn. I'm trying Spanish, but you could try French, Italian, Dutch, Norwegian, or others. With 10 to 15 minute lessons on your smartphone, tablet, or desktop, you'll learn how to have real life conversations. And right now, my listeners, you can get three months of Babbel free when you sign up for three months. Visit Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash grammar and use the offer code grammar. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash grammar and the offer code grammar. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and this week I have some wonderful listener comments, a quick and dirty tip about sentences that start with one of the, and a meaty middle about how to write a great introductory paragraph. A couple of weeks ago, we had a segment about phrases like carbon copy and dial a phone that come from the way we did things in days of yore. And when I asked if you could think of any more, you came up with some good ones. Kathy had another phone-related phrase. She said, we'd still say that someone rude hung up on us on the phone, but nobody is hanging up a receiver on a cell phone. Glenn noted that we still talk about penciling things in on a calendar, even though many of us now type entries into digital calendars, no pencil involved. Since most people don't use record players anymore, Shelley had to explain to one of her kids what she meant when she said someone sounded like a broken record. A record with a scratch in it can end up repeating the same short section over and over. Jack in Denver pointed out that when people originally wired money, it actually went across real telegraph wires. Tony teaches people how to use computers and says he comes across these kinds of phrases all the time. For example, we talk about cutting and pasting. He said, copywriters used to actually cut blocks of text with a pair of scissors and paste them into position with glue while creating documents to be copied. Now it's done digitally. It's true, and when I worked at a newspaper in high school, we cut copy with X-Acto knives and adhered it to the pages with wax. One night, I cut off a sliver of my left pointer finger with an X-Acto knife and got blood all over one of the pages. It was awful. <laughs> a Twitter user who goes by the name Israelite Ram had some media terms. The Ram correctly noted that we still talk about audio recording as taping, even though we don't use tape anymore. And TV people show footage, which is a reference to film, even though almost everything is digital now. Andrew has a good one from England. He says people in his country still talk about carting things around, even though there's almost never a cart involved. But my favorite future prediction was from Ken, who pointed out that with the rise of electric cars, pushing the gas pedal won't literally mean that we're sending gas to the engine. Those are just some of the phrases people sent me. Thanks to everyone, and I guess the bottom line is that our language is chock full of these kinds of terms. Next, let's tackle a tricky kind of sentence. A listener named Mwalimu on Facebook asked, which is correct? This is one of the novels that has made a mark in my life? Or this is one of the novels that have made a mark in my life? Someone asks me a question like this every six months or so, and I always have to look up the answer because for the life of me, I can never remember whether a sentence like this calls for a singular verb or a plural verb. I actually have a little bookmark in one of my usage guides on the page about this topic because I keep forgetting. Here's why. These are unusual sentences. Usage experts have disagreed about the answer for years— and it's an active area of language change. You look at the sentence and find yourself wondering whether your verb choice should be driven by the word one in one of the novels or should be driven by the word novels. There are some rules that say when you're considering subject-verb agreement, you should ignore prepositional phrases such as of the novels. But the problem is that those rules apply to simple sentences, such as the age of the novels is surprising. In that case, you can imagine lifting out the prepositional phrase and ending up with 
The age is surprising, and it's obvious that you should use a singular verb. But this sentence we're considering today is more complicated. This is one of the novels that have made a mark in my life. In this sentence, the verb you're considering is inside a relative clause, that have made a mark in my life. It's called a relative clause because it begins with one of the relative pronouns, that, that have made a mark in my life. And in a sentence like this, you don't ignore the prepositional phrase, because as Garner's Modern English Usage puts it, that is the subject of the relative clause, and it takes its number from the plural noun to which it refers. In this case, that word is novels, so you use a plural verb, one of the novels that have made a mark. That's the technical answer. On the other hand, Garner also concedes that most people these days would use a singular verb. He puts it at stage four on his language change index, which means the singular verb is virtually universal, but opposed on cogent grounds by a few linguistic stalwarts. Further, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of English Usage goes through the long history of experts who argued for a singular verb and those who argued for a plural verb. And their entry concludes by noting that Joseph Addison, a famous writer from the early 1700s, freely used both singular and plural verbs as he thought best fit his sentences. And they think you should feel free to do so too. So, if you want to be proper, if you want me to give you a rule, the rule is to use a plural verb and write that this is one of the novels that have made a mark in my life. But also, don't get too worked up about it because multiple experts say you shouldn't be bothered either way, which is probably why I can never remember how to deal with these tricky sentences and have to keep looking it up. My bookmark isn't going away anytime soon. So that's your somewhat unsatisfying quick and dirty tip. When you look at a sentence that talks about one of the plural nouns that does something, use a plural verb. But also, don't worry about it too much. Nobody else is sure which verb to use either. Before we get to the meaty middle, remember when summer was all about long, lazy days with nothing to do but read by the pool? Well, in the real world, as adults, summer is just as hectic as every other time of year. You know it's true. That's why I like Sunbasket. The food just shows up at my door. Sunbasket makes it easy to cook delicious, seasonal, nutritious meals no matter how busy I get. Sunbasket sends organic and non-GMO ingredients, pre-measured and ready to go, so I can prepare meals in just 30 minutes, or even less. Sunbasket takes the guesswork out of preparation, makes cleanup easier, and best of all, you get to skip the grocery store. And don't go thinking this is just for average eaters. If you follow paleo, gluten-free, lean and clean, and vegetarian diets, they also have plans for you, created by an award-winning chef and approved by nutritionists. Sunbasket meals are quick and delicious, and I can always find time for that. Go to sunbasket.com slash grammar today and get 50% off your first order. That's sunbasket.com slash grammar to get 50% off your first order sunbasket.com slash grammar. And now let's talk about how to start an essay, that important introductory paragraph. Sometimes the beginning isn't the best place to start, at least when it comes to writing essays. Composing a great first paragraph is important, but tackling it before your ideas are fully formed can lead to trouble. Don't let your essay start with a whimper. Instead, put it on the fast track to success with these four tips for writing compelling introductory paragraphs. 1. Don't write your introduction first. Maybe you have the perfect anecdote in mind for your introduction. Or maybe you're experiencing the anguish of a stubbornly blank computer screen. Either way, a wiser approach is to outline your thesis statement and your main points first. Then you can flesh out your introduction. End your first paragraph with a strong thesis statement that summarizes the central idea of your essay clearly and succinctly. Once you know where your destination is, it's much easier to decide on the direction for your opening paragraph. 2. Incorporate a bit of intrigue. 
What was the most interesting thing you learned while studying this topic? Is there a way to use this information to introduce your essay? Starting off with a wow factor that's relevant to your overall argument can be a powerful writing strategy. However, no matter how interesting your topic is, resist the urge to cram too many ideas or facts into your first paragraph. Your introduction is vital because it frames your writing as a whole. It should hint at what's to come without giving away every detail. Try these two simple steps to lead into your thesis sentence at the end of your introductory paragraph. Start with one compelling factor observation that'll keep the reader engaged enough to read more. Then add another sentence or two to show how you're linking that introductory idea to your thesis statement. It's that simple. Don't try to make it more complicated. You have the rest of your essay to fill in the details and give the broader context. Three, avoid obvious statements. Don't use broad generalizations that tell the reader nothing about where your essay is headed. Avoid cliches like, since the beginning of time, or the dictionary defines this term as, or worst of all, this essay will cover... Those statements don't tell your audience anything new, and worse, they can appear unoriginal. 4. Revise your work. Once you have your introductory paragraph drafted, it's time to review it with a critical eye. Most first drafts are wordy, so try doing a word count on your paragraph and then cutting that down by 20%. Your introduction may be longer or shorter depending on the overall length of your essay, but for an essay that's a few pages in length, challenge yourself to keep your first paragraph to no more than 100 words. Consider this example. The residents of the island of Puerto Rico have been U.S. citizens for 100 years, yet they do not have the right to cast their votes for the nation's president every four years. Twice in the past five years, people who voted in elections in the Caribbean territory have favored the idea of statehood. Yet a deep divide remains over what is the right course of action. The decision to make Puerto Rico the 51st U.S. state would help stabilize the island's dire financial situation while benefiting the nation as a whole, both in terms of the economy and the culture. Okay, so that was 104 words. Let's see if we can tighten it up and do better. In the original, we had, The residents of the island of Puerto Rico have been U.S. citizens for a hundred years. How about just, Puerto Ricans have been U.S. citizens for a hundred years? That's more straightforward and six words shorter. Later, we had, The decision to make Puerto Rico the 51st U.S. state would help to stabilize the island's dire financial situation. How about this? Making Puerto Rico the 51st U.S. state would help to stabilize the island's economy. Again, it's more clear and saves five words. Finally, the original ended, while benefiting the nation as a whole, both in terms of the economy and the culture. And we can tighten that to, while benefiting the nation as a whole, financially and culturally. Six words shorter, and it says the same thing. If you go to this article on quickanddirtytips.com, search for introductory paragraph, you can compare the entire original paragraph and the edited paragraph, which clocked in at 74 words after we were done with it. You'll see how much stronger self-editing and cutting just a few words can make your introductory paragraph. The faster you get to your interesting facts and your overall point, the more grateful and impressed your readers will be. That segment was written by Laura Wegman, a contributing writer for Varsity Tutors, a live learning platform that connects students with personalized instruction to accelerate academic achievement. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. I can hardly believe it, but K-12 through kids in my school district are going back to school on Monday. If you're looking for a good supplemental book to help your student write better this year, try my book, Grammar Girl Presents, The Ultimate Writing Guide for Students. A few years ago, it made the International Reading Association's Teacher's Choice List. That's Grammar Girl Presents, The Ultimate Writing Guide for Students. That's all. Thanks for listening.